My vision still includes a coalition effort of all women who engage in the struggle. It has been said that our strength is in our numbers, and that's a cliche, but it's true. Together we are more than half the world, and that's very powerful. It's very staggering. The goddess is here. The goddess is us. The goddess is here. The goddess is us. Some say there is no way to get to a place in the future that you haven't imagined already. Our image of the future, in, in essence, creates the future. One of the ways that's possible to do that is to take the uh, political aims and goals of the current women's liberation movement and extend them into utopian visions. This program is an attempt to seek out those utopian visions. Our search will lead us through novels of feminist future fantasy and to new modes of thinking. We will hear from women who are working to reclaim the goddess images of spirituality and from those who see the birth of a new age. We will trace connections between women's experiences and the Earth's and gather ideas from women and men on the future of human relationships. In our journey, we'll find that transforming feminist visions into reality will not be a simple achievement. But perhaps the richer the vision, the greater the possibility it will be achieved. Right now, um, the, the past, present, and future are converging. Women are discovering or uncovering our past which has been covered and recovered and recovered by patriarchal lies. And as we do that, we begin to live very intensely in the present. And this present is, at this very moment, a creation of the future. Past, present, future, forever linked. Time is the spiral on which we travel, familiar, yet different and new. Hello, I'm Lola Dalton and I will be your guide on this journey into feminist visions of the future. Baba Copper stated earlier that our image of the future creates the future. A rich source of this imagery can be found in feminist work of science fiction and fantasy. The novels of Marge Piercy and Dorothy Bryant give us two different glimpses of holistic societies which offer direction for the future. They are important because they present multi-dimensional images. In Woman on the Edge of Time, Marge Piercy tells the story of Consuelo Ramos, a present-day New York Chicana. With the help of Luciente, a woman from the year 2137, Consuelo Ramos develops the ability to travel to the possible future of Metapoiset. In a recent telephone conversation, we asked Marge Piercy about her novel. Woman on the Edge of Time is on one level a novel about uh, a, a good society which incorporates uh, a number of, the, of uh, my favorite ideas from, the, the, from feminism and from other recent movements for social change on one level. Uh, and it's about some of the factors in the present which will make it difficult to get there. Another fantasy novel is the kin of Atta are waiting for you. In this society, Dorothy Bryant portrays a world that parallels the present. The concluding sentence, the kin of Atta are waiting for you, was supposed to be a statement to assure the reader that what I meant was not somewhere else or some other time, but right now it was possible. And that I was talking about a place of the mind and spirit and soul uh, which surely would, you know, if that place began to be real for enough people, would surely change the world for us now and in the future. It's an island, actually, where people live in, according to their dreams, uh, where the dream is considered a, an important part of, the, of consciousness, of perception, and perhaps a route toward higher perception, higher consciousness. Um, into this island or world is uh, catapulted a person of the exact opposite type. That is a materialistic, uh, successful man who 
uh, epitomizes uh, the sort of person who is totally cut off from his real self. After a long period, he does begin to learn and to decide to learn their ways. And what he learns, actually, is the uh, discipline and purification of what's often referred to as the mystic way, uh, which is found in many philosophies, many religions. The, the various things that happen to him, the life on the island, uh, parallels the discipline of the mystic way. For instance, there are places uh, around the periphery of the main part of the island where there are tiny dugout structures, sort of like tiny igloos that the people retire to regularly when they're out of sorts, when they're beginning to feel ill, anything like that. Um, these are analogous to the retirement into oneself for a period of, of meditation, of getting in touch, getting into balance again. If you advance in the discipline, well, then the dream begins to be ready to tell you some higher things so that you begin to progress through what contemplatives would call stages of meditation until you reach, hopefully, that advanced stage that Simone Weil referred to as perfect attention and attendance on God. Um, and so he progresses through those stages, guided by uh, Augustine, who is a, a central woman character in it, a black woman who is, um, well, I guess we could call her a messiah, an avatar. Uh, this is one of the uh, uh, one of the, the character in it who I think made the book uh, especially appealing to feminists. Bryant and Percy offers us hope of parallel worlds, possible futures. But what of this world, this time, right now? What hope is there for today? There is so much to be done. Why be optimistic about tomorrow? Why live? It's like breathing. Huh? Uh, if I don't, I despair or life. I don't care to plod. I don't care to take a grim view of, of slow evolution. I do see a possibility of a clean bay growing oysters for our consumption. It's my strength. My, my religion is that belief that we can make change and that we will and it makes me feel sad, unpleasurable to, to dwell and stay in a world where I accept the plateau and the slowness or see an NUI and an alienation like existen existentialism called forth, which, I mean, I used to be there. You know, I used to be Nietzsche and all that stuff and it was impossible and nothing was but what we saw but now i see here you know i see here and here there's other ways of seeing and it's women have helped me to see that way an important part in feminist visions of the future is expansion of thought but what i'm primarily concerned with is opening up that 90 percent of the brain that seems to have been atrophied and uh, helping us to learn to ask new questions and to dismiss the wrong questions to get to the hidden agendas that have programmed our questioning and questing. The, the kind of thinking that most of us were trained in is like a grid. It's uh, very linear. If you had a blackboard, uh, I would imagine drawing here a straight line. And imagine that someone who, who thinks linearly sees only that line right now. Someone comes along with spinning, th spiraling thought. And then imagine the spiral being drawn so that it crosses the line. But what the linear trained mind doesn't see is all the rest of it. It doesn't see the spiral, but only sees where it's contiguous with the line. In other words, a bunch of dots. A lot of things which seem to be very fragmented or disparate or different are profoundly interconnected. And one of the ways in which our minds have been warped in patriarchal society is that we haven't been able to see the connections among these divided things. Now, seeing the connections and naming them, I call spinning. When I do move into that space where my thought is spinning, I'm constantly recapturing the past and transforming it as I live now. And as I'm doing this, I am moving. But when you're spinning in a sort of vertigo of creation, you can't 
say, oh, that's directly ahead because you're not on a flat road. We can say a spiral is a symbol of rebirth or going in to uh, ourselves or spiraling out or talk about it being a very, very ancient uh, kind of symbol. A spiral is within a shell. A shell is a protective symbol. It's a uh, nourishing kind of symbol. It's a symbol of transformation, as fire is also very much a symbol of, of transformation. But I don't like to get into, as soon as you see a spiral, you think of just one thing, because that kills it off. It really takes all the freshness out of it. And I think taking, if we use these uh, ancient symbols, which we all seem to very, very naturally uh, are attracted to, that we should uh, be embodying them, endowing them with, with a sense of newness and freshness as far as the interpretation of them are concerned. They are something different each time, and I don't like to think of any of those as having a set meaning. Many feminists are also seeking to celebrate woman's spirituality through the ancient pagan religion called Wicca. Wicca is an old Anglo-Saxon word meaning wise one. Today, feminist Wicca is revitalizing the positive aspect of witchcraft. See Budapest? and Stahawk are both high priestess in feminist Wicca. Both are women of strong conviction. I feel that women's liberation will go no place unless we have our own spiritual life, our own holy books, our own rituals, and um, we can involve ourselves in developing all these talents that we were kept from. I was a witch before I was a feminist, and when I became a feminist, it just made a lot more sense to me, and I realized um, how all the women's liberation is for naught if we don't liberate the spirit. And since that was something I have known about since I was born, I felt that should be my contribution to my own, the elevation of my sex. The religion that I would like to see would be based on the idea of the goddess that religion is not an escape from the world or an escape into something else, and it's focused on the earth, on relationships with other b human beings, on our relationships with animals, with nature, with plants, with ecology, and that it would be experiential rather than a belief system or a doctrine. You know, that it would be based on things people actually do and feel and experience together, um, not on somebody telling you, you've got to believe this, you've got to worship this, you've got to say this. We are terribly different from the patriarchal books who are full of don'ts and Ten Commandments. We don't have a Ten Commandment, we have only one. And it says, do as thou wilt and harm none. And if you can do that, you do fine. If you get rid of the idea that um, religion is a belief system and you look upon it more as poetry, you know, it's a metaphor for reality, which is actually not something we can ever really know ourselves. Um, then you see that science is simply another set of metaphors, and they're very useful for certain things. Um, religious metaphors are useful for other things, but the two aren't contradictory. You know, they complement each other. And if the goddess is really truly imminent in the world, then science is simply another way of approaching her. Each nation who related to the life force created their own image of the goddess and gave them their own names, and the goddess always looks like those people who relate to her. So you don't have to worship uh, a totally out of race uh, type of deity. Women are basically going to have their heritage back. That there are wonderful goddess legends from Africa, from China, from Mexico, from the Celts, Scandinavians, you know, just every possible racial and ethnic culture you can think of. There are goddess legends and heroine legends. And so at this point, I'm just so wound up in the idea that each one of us will have our own racial and ethnic heritage back, along with the, uh, the fullness of our entire woman heritage. It is not that um, the goddess is uh, an idol. It is simply that these ethnic groups relate to her, give her, her their own names and relate to her. The force is one, we understand that, but it's okay to give her 10,000 names in 10,000 languages and make up 10,000 creative rituals around it. Woman's religion is organic, close to the earth, close to life, recognizing the spark of transcendence in all of us. 
female, male, human. Observance of nature's rebirth is a link to our own, symbolic of the spiral growing of our inner self. We work towards a more holistic world where head and heart are of one being, where sin and guilt and sexual taboo do not enslave, but where respect and reverence for life itself makes these words meaningless, where war, destruction, and hatred have no place on monetary support, where there is celebration for our differences as well as our sameness, where it is understood that we are all life ever connected. So by connecting both the sameness and, and the differences, we can honor each other in, in, in a heart that has no fear of the other's power. It's very important to see each other in, in a rainbow way instead of black and white. A rainbow of women's culture is emerging with its own ritual and art forms. According to author and poet Robin Morgan, there has been nothing like it since the Italian Renaissance. I call it the, the, the women's renaissance. I mean, it really is happening with, with an energy um, that simply has not been seen uh, in, in recent Western history. It is that kind of scientific and artistic and aesthetic and political reverberation, and one thing connects to another, and, and uh, uh, God, it's exciting. So art is being brought into life Life is being brought into art, and the old distinctions really are beginning to um, be diffused, and I think that we are now entering a period of very um, radical new transitions in what life and art are, and perhaps we will all reach the stage that will be true again of, of like the old Balinese saying, which was, we have no art, we do everything the best we can. Barbara Hammer's films are an example of this personal and political style of art. I think probably the moon goddess is the easiest to talk about that way because Gloria Churchwoman and myself made the film in a quest to find land for women. And we went into Death Valley after preparing ourselves by camping in the desert and cooking and eating sparingly and having visions the night before to find their temples, space, supposedly uninhabitable that we could claim for ourselves. And that night before we went in, I walked away from the campfire out into the desert and I saw the Big Dipper, the constellation in the sky, move from its sort of slant position, tip. And when it tipped, white milk poured out, much denser than the Milky Way. And it poured out over women on the desert in all kinds of employment jobs. One woman was sitting there in the middle of the desert typing, and this milk was washing her. And another woman was changing a tire in a car. Another woman was building a bridge. There, were, there was this sense of, of being nourished by mother's milk. And I went back to the campfire, and I told Gloria I was kind of making fun of myself which is one of the things that we women who don't live the future do. And she said, Barbara, don't do that to yourself. If you have a vision, honor it. Believe in it and follow it. That feminist art which we're talking about is not simply performed or exhibited in museums or galleries, which are secluded white spaces where art is being shown in a, sh in a, in a temple which is aloof uh, away from life but rather feminist art is being exhibited all over town in many places that are not necessarily art places feminist art performances take place on city hall or in the city mall or in laundromats or in on the streets or in um, shops window shops or on buses. Much of this feminist art that I'm talking about is really being created by feminist artists who have been educated in the Feminist Studio Workshop at the Women's Building in Los Angeles. And in my experience, that is where that most radical art that I'm talking about in that sense is being created. And that um, to create art like that, it is necessary to create supportive institutions. The Women's Building is a public center for women's culture. 
And that kind of art is not created in isolation. That kind of art is created out of the support and collaboration of many women. Founded in 1973, the Los Angeles Women's Building has become the symbol of the women's renaissance. The LA Women's Building, I think, is an inspiration for future directions, for sure, and uh, presents a model of both the difficulties and the rewards of living in systems like it. Chrysalis Magazine is another example of a public institution in the sense of women creating their own media. We now have a number of very good um, feminist magazines about women's culture. What's so important about works like that, uh, whether, whether they are fictional works, um, uh, visionary work, poetry, whether they are, whether they are specifically, quote, artistic, um, or whether they are academic, whether they are scholarly works, is that each of them are like a, a, a tile, a stone in that mosaic. And, and to begin to, you know, to see it evolve, I mean, it will not evolve, I hope, from any one way, um, but from the shimmer of all of those different tiles and the options that they present. And that's what's really exciting. Concern for the environment is another major characteristic of feminist visions of the future. As the world becomes mechanized, we become slaves to machines, and there is no feeling, no respect for life. Women fear the strangler and the rapist. The more terrible women's experience, the more terrible the earth. Where there is less regard for the earth, there is less regard for women. Our dream, control over our own bodies, protection of the planet Earth, a world without rape, for either, where consent is a cultural obsession. It is not impossible at all that a culture could be based on the careful and delicate and sensitive negotiation of consent before all action, and that that negotiation of consent could include, as it has, I think, in Native American cultures, where the, where the negotiation of consent includes negotiation literally with one's prey. This kind of sensitivity has been known before, and there's no reason why it can't be known again. And we have to see a positive a culture, a positive vision. We have to have that image in order to get there. There's no way to get someplace in the future that you haven't imagined already. The alienation that a lot of people feel uh, meant to, in, in our urban environment, especially the urban environments where the, uh, the corporate image is manifest the most in, in a kind of um, blatant sort of way. The, the, hard, the hard edges, um, the confined, this constricting space is the kind of controlling of space. It seems to me more and more not only patriarchal, but in a, in a way pornographic because it's manipulation. And it's a kind of um, power play of space over people. And I think women feel this very, very keenly. And that's why I started with women and women who were not design, designers. They were not trained in the design professions. Architect Phyllis Birkby has collected drawings which express women's fantasies about their living space. I thought that their images would speak a little more loudly, a little more clearly. I think one of the aspects of these, um, in these fantasies, that, that they are um, not just wishful thinking, that I think they, they tend more and more to um, really point to things that we can actually do, things that we can actually change. A lot of the drawings would have a kind of um, communal thing in the middle with all these uh, individual private spaces and different functions with little buffer zones in between. And then always options. The option was one of the most important things that have come through is the demand for that, you know, that, that almost uh, all the drawings have that kind of element in them. A lot of them um, speak about relationships within a space, and they're redefining relationships, and I'm interested in, um, in the redefinition of the family. We are talking about going back 
to old extended forms um, of not only blood and, and legal contract, but of choice, of friendship, of shifting relationships, but also of new forms that have never existed before or are variations that have never existed before. And yet another is um, uh, the emphasis that we are putting more and more on the necessity for men to nurture, for men to parent, not just help her with the job, but to really be an active um, organic presence in, the, in, in child raising. Uh, and not only for what that would do for uh, women, which is a little more free time, but that it would be indeed very consciousness raising and humanizing for men and, and for children. At this point, I think one of the best things that happened to men, if they could accept it, would be feminism. If they could expect equal responsibility for equal privilege from the woman. In a recent telephone conversation, we asked June Singer, author of Androgyny, about the future of human relationships. There will be, I believe, a much freer exchange of relationships in the future. I think people won't get into relationships or hold on to them simply because of a personal need that's based on a neurotic sense of insufficiency in themselves. I think that people's ability to move back and forth between the opposites of their own personality will make them feel secure in themselves and will give them an opportunity to respect other people a lot more. They'll respect people as people. Right now, we are in a period of disequilibrium. The old sex roles no longer hold up, and people, especially women, are refusing to abide by them. The old system is gone, and it's never going to come back again. And the new equilibrium has yet to be established. We don't know what it's going to be like, but it's surely on the way. I'm seeing a lot of struggle with the idea of androgyny, especially among men as they observe women taking on the more active roles that they have been afraid of in the past. Men don't know exactly how to relate to this. It'll take them a while before they see that it's to their advantage to do so. If we stop being self-righteous, if we stop being authoritarian and stop feeling each one of us has the, the proper information, the right answer, and listens to the other ones and uh, really considers what's being said by each person, will arrive at a better future. The fact that men are beginning to realize that it's okay to have emotions, which some men are beginning to do, is a big step. Um, um, so there's, there's little things going on, but I think we're only in the early stages, maybe a couple of years into uh, the beginning awareness, but I suspect that we're going to see an explosion of awareness about gender in general. I'm beginning to feel that the entire complex of what it means to be a man is almost just like a perennial hallucination. I think what you'll have is a, is a completely kind of, of, of of new and different woman and a and, and new and different man and that perhaps eventually those distinctions will come to mean nothing perhaps technologically in terms of, of uh, sexual reproduction it will even maybe come to mean nothing I don't know that, that that is all something that at the moment is terrifyingly that technology in the hands of the patriarchy and it's one reason why I want you know we all want women to get in there and have those tools so that we determine that future too. Women's studies professor Patricia Huckle agrees. Access to the biological sciences is central to any possible resolution of the issue of the consequences of the capacity to reproduce. Do we really want to relinquish control of fertility and birth? Do we have the choice? Not unless there is crossover influence and communication. The whole concept of parthenogenesis is something that's being talked about in the women's movement. Uh, virgin birth uh, is a is a fact in many species of vertebrates uh, in which th uh, it especially is a fact of life in, in species that face disturbed habitats if other species have uh, this 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 uh, ability to alternate between um, between parthenogenic birth and, uh, and sexual birth, same species, then it may very well be that we have that, uh, that DNA programming also.
course, men are also involved in trying to reproduce by themselves. So that quest is going on not only in feminist or lesbian separatist camps, but there's no question in my mind that, that those things are possible and desirable in a separatist situation. And there is a need to separate from the patriarchy. That's, to me, the true meaning of separatism. Many, there's much uh, misinterpretation of separatism as man-hating, for example, and although uh, men are not the favorite of many separatists, to be sure. That is not really the purpose of separatism. Separatism is to withdraw from the patriarchal systems insofar as we can. A lot of the oppression of women has, has literally taken place via the oppression of her sexuality. And that women's power over both understanding their own sexuality and being and having control of their own stimulation, their own sexual stimulation, is 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 a political issue. It's it's not biological. It's not physiological. It's political. Women have got to have self determination, and discover and invent and create who we are, which we are already doing, uh, but to do so with the political, economic, and every other kind of power. Uh, so that that is not done just among ourselves in some feminist ghetto, but that it transforms the entire society and indeed the entire world. Feminist visions extend to a new economic and political self-determination. Tracing a political thread, Ron Hirschbein, professor of philosophy, sees a connection between economics and sexism. Granted, I mean, 